All right, so in this video, I'm gonna go over all the important information and topics in chapter three. So this is essentially gonna be a cram session video where I'm gonna quickly go over everything, not in too much detail, but just enough so you can, you know, um, go over this and watch this during your passing period before classes. So for those of you maybe that didn't study and stayed up all night partying or doing whatever, this is your chance to redeem yourself. So what I'm going to do is go over these learn objectives that I have right here. And this is basically what I covered in this chapter and what would typically be covered in any um, AP statistics course. So take a minute and pause the video and write these down so that you can have them as a reference sheet. So let's get started. So the big idea in this chapter is to recognize that we want to be able to study the relationship between two quantitative variables, two quantitative variables, meaning that they can be, um, you know, measured with like, you know, numbers on a scale, like, you know, weight versus height, versus weight versus, you know, um, speed, weight versus number of calories you eat. And we're going to have one of the variables called the explanatory variable, which we're going to put on the x-axis. And the other one's gonna be our response variable, response, which is gonna be on the y-axis. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna plot, you know, the data as a scatter plot, you know, probably what you did back in the, the day in middle school, um, in your earlier grades. And then we're gonna to try to see what this um, the scatter plot tells us about the variables. So let's say we're doing, you know, maybe, maybe you have like a calories eaten as your explanatory variable versus um, the, your weight, the weight of, you know, how much somebody weighs, weight. So we say the calories would be the explanatory variable because that's what we're gonna think is, is what causes a change in someone's weight. Now we know that's not gonna be that the case that whoever eats more is gonna automatically weigh more, but we can, you know, for the most part say that, you know, the more calories you consume, the more you're gonna weigh. Now, um, Let's go over um, a more um, thorough example so we can really get all these concepts down. And we're going to refer back to the problem in, the, in my notes that we worked on earlier. So remember, we have this data that ha has information on the first age that these children spoke versus their score on this test. So score is their response variable. Age is the explanatory variable. And it looks like that the later in life that they spoke their first word, the lower that their score tended to be. So um, when we have a scatter plot, we're gonna to need to describe, describe it by mentioning four factors. These are gonna be the direction. We're gonna to need to mention any, if there are any outliers. You're gonna to need to mention the form and the strength. I remember, I remember I called this DOFs, mention of DOFs. This is not gonna to be told to you explicitly on your um, test and on, on, and on your AP exam. You're gonna to to be told to describe the data to make sure you mention direction, outliers, form, strength. Now, when we're talking about direction, you know, is it going in a negative or positive direction? So this is negative. So we can say it's, you know, negative since, you know, the odds are going down. The outliers values that don't follow the, um, rest of the points so this could be a potential ally you can see there's one possible ally over here um the form we're just gonna <clears throat> we're just gonna say if it's gonna be um linear or non-linear now um data in this um course is gonna be given to you so you're not like confused about whether it's gonna be linear or non-linear so we're just gonna say you know this looks about approximately linear so just Worry about, you know, saying if, you, saying if it's linear or nonlinear. And then the strength, just go with medium, weak, or strong. You know, so I'm saying this is about medium. Now, um, when we have a set of data, we create this line called the regression line or least squares, least squares regression line. And what that does is it allows us to predict Y values from X values. So this is a line of prediction and we have it in the form Y hat equals A plus BX. It's a linear equation, except it has different, you know, letters for your slope. The slope is B 
and the y-intercept is a, and this is, and the and and the y hat again is predicted y value. Make sure you put the y hat because it has to be predicted y value. Now we can figure out these um, values of a and b by looking at this table here. We just have to know where to look. This is going to be our a because that's the constant coefficient. So a is going to be equal to 109.874. The B, the coefficient of the variable age, so the B is negative 1.127. So A and B, and we also need to be able to interpret these values in the context of the problem, not just say, oh, the slope is negative 1.27 and the slope intercept is 109.874. So what we have to say is what this represents in the context of this problem. So it's remember the slope geometrically is a change in y over the change in x. In this case, it would be the change in score over the change in age. So what this is saying is, you know, this is the same as negative 1.127 over one. We're saying as the age that a child takes um, to speak increases by one month. So as, as a child takes one more month to speak their first word, their score on this test goes down by about 1.127 points. So this says as the age goes up by one month, the score is predicted to go down by about 1.127 points. So that's the slope. The y-intercept is, you know, where would the line intersect the y-axis when x is zero or when the age is zero? So when the age is zero, this is saying that we would predict the score to be about 109.874. Now, um, but that makes sense in real life? Well, it can't because you can't be age zero. If you're age zero, you're not gonna be able to take a test. So this wouldn't make sense in real life. So always make sure to keep that um, in mind because don't just think of it as just a number. We have to make sure if the number makes sense in the problem. Now, there's also what's called the correlation coefficient R. The correlation coefficient R will tell you the strength of a relationship if we can say it's linear. If we can't say it's linear, then the R doesn't actually mean anything. Um, and I'm gonna explain how we know if it's linear in just a minute. Now, the R value can always be between negative one and positive one. Um, if, it's, if it's close to one or negative one, that means that the relationship is pretty strong. When it's positive, it means that the, the relationship is positive, you know, it will go in this direction. If the R value is negative, that would say the relationship is negative. It would go down in that direction. If the closer R is to zero, says that relationship is you know, pretty weak. Now, how do we find it from this? Well, over here, we can see we have the R squared value. That's how it's gonna be written. It says that R squared is 41%. So we put that as a decimal, 0.41. And to find R, we get the square root of 0.41. You know, that's just what it is mathematically. So the square root of 0.41 is about 0.64. So the correlation coefficient is 0.64. And so then we could say that there seems to be a, a reasonable, you know, re reasonably strong, now we'll make, I just say, just say moderate, um, moderately strong relationship between age and score. And again, we can say that if we can, if we can determine that the relationship is linear. So how do we do that? Well, we have to look at something called a residual plot. Well, what is the residual plot? It's a graph of the residuals versus the exclamatory variable. In this case, the graph the residual versus the age. Now let's look at what residuals are. Residuals are essentially the prediction errors. If you look at these points, we can obviously tell they're not all on the line, you know, they're off. And I'm gonna draw these vertical line segments to represent how off they are in the y direction. These vertical distances are the values of the residuals. These residuals are essentially prediction errors and you would get them by taking the actual y values, maybe the actual, Minus the predicted y values. Minus the predicted predicted y, actual y. So I like to use the acronym RAP. Whoops. 
the residual is equal to actual value minus predicted value. You can also write this as, you know, just y minus y hat. And again, just again, just think how what you know. Again, it makes complete sense. Residuals, how much, how different the actual values are, which are these points. These are from the predicted ones. The predicted points are all on the line, so we simply just have to find that difference by subtracting them. So that's all the residuals are. So what we have here is a residual plot. These residual plots are just plotted as the y coordinates on this graph and these are essentially gonna be the same as those values here. It's just on a different scale, so it's gonna look a little different, but if you play one into detail, you could tell they're exactly the same. Remember, this is centered at zero. A residual of zero means that the points are exactly on the line. When it's neg when the residuals are negative, as these ones, that tells us that the um, points are below the line, that they're under predictions or the line over predicted in. Now what we want is the residual plot just to be a random pattern. We don't want no systematic pattern. When there's a random pattern, that means that the linear model will be okay to use. So we want random scatter. So in this case, we don't see no obvious pattern in a residual plot. So that's good. And so it's okay to use a linear model for this data. And, um, and the problems that you're gonna get in this course, it's gonna be pretty clear if there's a pattern or there's not a pattern. So don't worry about like being like, well, how do I know if there's a pattern? Isn't there a pattern? So it's gonna be obvious. So there's no obvious pattern. It's okay to use the, the, the least squares regression line, which is a linear model. Now, what is the least squares regression line? The least squares regression line is a line that best approximates these data points. Because think about it, like how do we know if this straight line is the best one to use? Isn't there another one? Well, what happens is that the calculator or the technology or the mathematicians have invented this formula that creates a line so that these squared residuals, which I'm drawing right here, these squared, if I was to add up the sum of all these squares of all the residuals, these squares would, would sum up to the smallest possible value of all the straight lines that there are. That there are. So this line will have the smallest sum of those squared residuals out of all the possible lines. And that's why we call it the least squares regression line. Now, we also have, again, um, a value of S, which is the standard deviation of the residuals, and R squared. Now, the S value, the st which is the standard deviation of the residuals, tells you essentially the same um, sort of thing that you've known standard residuals to tell us about, you know, data in previous chapters. And that is essentially how far off on average are your predictions from the, the true values. So this is saying that your predictions are about 11, 11.0229 points in this case, about 11.0229 points off the true value. So these are the prediction errors. So, this, so that's what the standard deviation of the residuals tell you. So the bigger the standard deviations, the, um, the more inaccurate your line would be, the, you know, the bigger the spread of the values, the smaller the standard deviation, the more um, precise your line would be because, because the, the points would be closer to the line, the, line, the points would be more approximate. So we want small standard deviations. So that means we have a better model, a more accurate model. Now the R squared, you know, is essentially a, a number or which we write as a percent that tells you the percent of variation that is accounted for by the least squares regression line relating this data. This is saying that 41% of the variation between X and Y is accounted for by this model. Meaning that like we know that you know, that age and, you know, their score on this test are related. We know that, you know, there is some relationship, but there's a bunch of other things that, can, that, you, that you kinda, that we can account for. We can say maybe this, you know, just their, um, maybe their health, you know, their, their, their genes, other stuff. You know, maybe their, their homes, maybe their living style. Um, there's a bunch of things that can account for their scores. So we say that only about 41% of this variation is accounted for by, by this data. And, 
the last thing is make sure you know how to use um, your calculator to, um, you know, ca calculate this stuff. Pretty straightforward. You just go to stat in your calculator. Um, make sure you have data in your list, L1 and L2. And what I could do is press stat, go to calc, go down to linear regression. I like to use this form. And I'm gonna type L1 comma L2, press enter. And I'm gonna get the parameters of my least squares regression line and my coefficient of determination, R squared, and my correlation coefficient, R. So that's gonna help you when you're doing these problems. A lot of times you'll just have computer output, but also make sure you know how to use the formulas on your formula sheet because you may not be given data and you're gonna to have to know how to find the slope and y-intercept. And it's simple because you can find it from the means and standard deviations of X and Y. So there you go. Good luck.